And I like to greet everyone and welcome those who's here and probably those who may see the video. Um, welcome them to the Biblical School of Global Liberation for All Oppressed Peoples. Um, we are the Congregation of Israel or the Knesset. And we have a political branch, the NMP, Nazarene Messianic Party. And this is uh, what we consider um, our school, which we are building here to inherit the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So um, I hope this will be um, edifying and I pray also encouraging. Uh, Romans, the second chapter. Well, we're going to do a quick review. I, I guess the reason why I'm doing it this route, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, some, I've, including um, myself and the process that um, I've been going through and learning and um, also just through the years hearing questions and the question um, would be, well, how, do, how, 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 you know, how is all of this, you know, you know, I, I ne you know, I would never even think you could mix this politics and the Bible together. How you come up with this and how you come up with that? And then I understand why, because, oh, people, I understand why people ask that question because we're so accustomed to being taught the Bible in a certain or a particular context. In fact, when we read different things, it's likely that some of us will go back off into default mode uh, from what we normally been taught because that's just all what we have to work with. So going back and repeating these things and bringing it back to our remembrance, the context in which the Apostle Paul is writing, so often when we read the writings of the Bible, we often put the Bible in our own context. Even more so, um, that's even more um, of a mistake to put it in the context of the 19th and 20th century. Um, but we have to put it in its own context so we can understand what's happened in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and be able to properly apply it. So in order for us not to continue to go back and what, you know, and what we have normally been taught and looking at things and our observation um, from the standpoint or from the perspective of West, Western theology, I like to keep repeating it, even for myself, you know, this repetition, we have to build the, this context. And once we learn more and more of world struggles, global struggles, and what the Bible is saying, then, you know, uh, the Most High, I, I believe, will um, allow us to make these um, necessary adjustments. It's just similar to when you're coming up and, uh, uh, you know, when people have images of Christ. And it, it, for a while, and you know, when you think of Jesus Christ, you know, for a while, you may default into the pictures that you normally have seen on the wall of the Euro Gentile. Um, but the more you learn, the more you understand, the more you understand the context, you don't even really, that don't really even come to mind once you become, you know, have, once you have grown into the text. So it's the same thing here when we're looking at these politics. And um, one thing I want us to remember as we moving forward is remember Paul's context and where he's arguing from. Um, 
we took the time to go through saints. He's remember he's calling the saints and remember what the saints are going to do. They're going to talk about the glory of God kingdom and um, which is an everlasting kingdom. This is what we read in Psalms. Uh, and, and, and the Psalter also argued that, uh, you know, let the saints sing aloud upon their beds with the two-edged sword in their hand, prepare, for, prepare to seize um, the power and to bind kings and nobles with fetters of iron. That hasn't changed. You know, it's, 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 it's just things that they have put in our mind when we read the Bible that we think this is what the Bible is talking about. Sometimes I get aggravated, like today was time I was doing some research and I'm reading some of the, these people literature and they talk about the love of God and they wonder, well, how can God hate? And how can a loving God uh, hate? And you know, how do you reconcile? Is it, you, to reconcile, you need to understand love. And what, once you understand love, then uh, the biblical concept of love, then it won't be much of a conflict. But if you have the Greek, concept of love you always got to be nice you you know you do you know you can't you know be angry at nobody that's just that leads to a lot of confusion especially when you read the law and the prophets so it's just things we've been taught and i think going over and over again is just uh, like paul say renewing the mind and um remember brothers and sisters this argument that Paul is presenting. These saints, they will seize power. That's their destiny. This is how he began his letter. Why? Because it's been assured that they receive, that they will receive power, or if we're so blessed to be saints, that we will receive power. The assurance was stamped and confirmed by the resurrection. When the uh, resurrection, broke forth into the earth and it, this have began to take place by way of Yahushua ben Dawid or Jesus, the son of David or the Christ or Mashiach, all right? So that process broke into human affairs. And this is what Paul is saying. This is now this, 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 this process is growing and it will yield more um, uh, men into the resurrection. But however, this is the, you know, this process that's taking place um, with the resurrection of the dead is it, it, it must be founded. Those who will be permitted to reign with this transition of the human body there's also comes a requirement and that is that the heart of the human body or the mind or the consciousness must reach a, a different level. And this is signified by the laws of God written on our hearts <clears throat> and in our minds. So this is the destiny of the saints. Assured by Jesus of Nazareth, whom Paul said that he was a a slave under. Then he began to talk about injustice. And that's what we, I want you to remember, starting from chapter one, as we enter into chapter two today, we're going to finish off just a quick review uh, from chapter one, starting at verse 28 and going into chapter two. But it's some parallels, and I don't want to rush through it. It's, it's parallels here. Now, remember, um, it's not just a Roman religion and economics. All religions have been based upon economics, meaning the super, superstition of the false gods. And I, we, I found this through the grace of God, found the same record in Egypt, found the same record in Babylon. In fact, Babylon writing, banks, the, the, the like I said before, the original banks, you know, economists will tell you that they're actually um, the offspring of Babylonian temples. So when we're looking at the gods and economics, we're looking at 
a a institution of BLM or the Lords or the ruling class. And these institutions of religion, um, their primary goal is to cause uh, the masses of humanity to serve and to labor for them so they can live in uh, luxury and rule. Um, they don't want to do their part. You know, so they want to exploit human labor. They want to exploit human beings. And, you know, we get into even deeper on, on, on the, the, the psyche of that, that, that psychotic or that um, just psychopathic type of thinking. It's a schism in humanity. Now, here, this excerpt, you could look it up. This was a seminar that was going on back in 2015, I believe. And you, if you type in Roman religion and economics, it'll pop up. But I didn't um, put down the, because it wasn't necessarily a website, it was an advertisement. So I just copied it because it got right to the point of other research that if you take your time, you'll find it's the same thing. Or if you look at some of our past videos and God willing, we'll be doing them again, where you will you know, be able to put this together. But it says from institutions to individuals, religion shaped the Roman economy. Religion shaped all economies. All the way back to Babylon. Temples served as treasuries and banks. This is like I was just finished explaining. That is true of the very first imperialist regime that spawned post flood the ancient Ethiopians or the empire of Babylon. So in the priesthoods, came with political power. Um, the expansion of Roman religion transformed econom economies throughout the empire, affecting established institutions and creating new centers of sacred consumption and production. Um, Roman religion mobilized vast quantities of wealth and resources, but tensions between traditional um, piety and financial expenditure remained. This dynamic interplay between religion and the economy created a complex system that has hitherto received little attention. And I agree. And that's why we're talking about it. Um, it has received little attention. We have to put religion in its context. Now, what have religion served to do? It was institutions creating new centers of sacred consumption and production by uh, way of injustice and inequalities. So Paul began to talk about how through their injustices, they have uh, take, have taken the glory of God and have made idols pretty much and have made these different superstitions and religions. Now, again, tie the superstition in not alone, but you must put it in the chain reference of economics and exploitation. That's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about, he's comparing the Christ and the saints, Jesus of Nazareth, He's bringing him in because there's a good news. This is a world free of exploitation. Now, in his letter, he's going to bring in the contrast or it's this juxtaposition of Christ or Mashiach, the good news of Christ, good news of Caesar's. We went through a few weeks ago. Okay, now with that being said, now he's going to start to elaborate on some things. And remember, the, it's the ruling class uh, of the teachings I could, God willing, we can go in to show you. No, I am not saying that the poor doesn't have any responsibility. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there's a great responsibility among the shepherds. This is what the Bible teach. It's nothing that I came up with because I'm just mad. Uh -uh. I am just simply going off what the Bible teach. The Bible clearly says that it is the shepherds that have caused the people to go astray. However, because of traditional understanding of shepherds, when a person says shepherd or pastor, what do you normally think of? Well, you think of somebody who's heading some kind of a religious assembly. That's the, that's the furthest thing from the mind of the prophets when they wrote that. When he's talking about shepherds and pastors, they was talking about the political leaders, okay? So uh, the political leaders were the shepherds and pastors. Now, this takes us again back once you be understanding, you'll see it all over the place because it's been hitting and, and, and it's been hitting in, in plain sight. You'll see the political connections just all over the place. It, you, where 
it'll become just downright ridiculous for a person to say they don't believe that the Bible and politics should mix. When you run into that person, then you have run into a person who don't really know what the Bible's saying. So what we have here is his arguments, these com comparisons with the righteousness or the justice of God and the truth of God, which will uh, actually eventually collide with the injustice of men which restrain and hold the truth of God. Now, I want to look at that a little bit as we work our way through. And partly one way that injustice prevails is through religion, because it is nothing but a tool to fuel the local economies. That's, that's just what it's simply about to this day. All of the religions and all of the festivals is tied into the economy. That's how businesses do well, okay? Uh, according to them. But the Bible teaches us they're heaping themselves up treasures uh, that's going to destroy them. I don't know why this isn't. Come on, brother. Let me see what's going on with this thing. All right, hopefully he's in now. Wouldn't let me bring him in. Now look at this. Let's check this out now. Now, remember Romans. So this is our quick review. We're going to look at what just that one verse 18 just to remember what I'm arguing. Here I have a just this backdrop is a Rome, the Roman Senate. Okay, now these is where these are the elders of Rome. These are the ones with the religion prevail. These are the ones, the rich uh, ruling class who, you know, it's the economy. That's all what it's about, the economy and the riches of the few. So remember, as we move forward, um, verse 18 of Romans, the first chapter, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now, um, for our um, reference here, um, again, unrighteousness is a dikia, adikia, injustice, the opposite of justice, okay? So we're looking at the opposite of justice or injustice. This is what we're looking at in 18. Now, why I'm going back to 18? Because this is the this is the platform he have laid for us to put the rest of his letter into the context of his argument. And one reason why I believe he had to, the way he's writing and it's necessary to understand the background because, you know, um, these letters, like I said before, it's treason. That's serious business. You know what I mean? That's serious business. Letter, you know, what he wrote could bring him up on charges at any moment. So I don't know how much that affected on how he wrote, relying on the people to study the scriptures to understand what he's saying. You know, so it was very important that they un that they read the scriptures. So just imagine us 2000 years ago, we're receiving this letter and our base is the text. We're going to compare his letter to the text. So the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and injustice of men, all injustice of men who hold the truth in injustice. You see that? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness or injustice? So the truth is held. What do you mean by hold? Let's just look at it again. Hold, Greek 27, 22, suppressing, to hold fast, hold back, bind or arrest detain or restrain and we're going to look at it because honestly speaking if we just read romans without a context what is the injustice he's talking about what you i mean wouldn't that be a question it should be 
All right, what exactly is holding what? Okay, we see that unrighteousness is injustice. And this injustice is restraining or detaining the truth of God. Now, what is that? How, what, what, what is the description of that? Can we be descriptive? And that's what I want, that's why I want us to understand. So when we're looking at it, we can start to see, okay, is this talking about anything? I mean, what it, meaning people could come up with different ideas on what injustice mean. And this truth of God, you know, most of you hear people say, well, it's the law. It is the law in a most general sense, but it's being more specific. In the most general sense, it's so general, it'll be difficult for you to understand his argument. So we want to be more specific. We want to go into what he's arguing. The truth of God is being detained or restrained by injustice, right? Okay. Now, with that being said, we're going to go a little further. Now, look, keeping that in mind, let's go to skip down to verse 28 now as we read out. Now, when we read this, for example, we can, you can get 10 different people to read this and think and, and imagine 10 different things. Now, notice this, Romans 1 and 28. Even as they did not, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or things which are not proper. Now, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What does that mean? What wasn't they retaining? What do we mean they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge? In other words, is he arguing that they did not they did not desire to know god why because they held the truth by injustice they restrained the truth the truth of god they restrained it's through the truth of god that we know god well they didn't want to know god now for those of you who've been around for a while this isn't just haphazardly thrown around you ask people do they know god and you will have people say yeah, i know the lord because they're thinking of no as some form of memory knowledge or an acknowledgement to acknowledge yes i believe that god here yes i know that there's a god that's i'm arguing that's not what he's that, that's not what he's saying but we could come to that conclusion if we don't have a context to put paul into and you say well what context are you putting them into i'm putting them into the context of the prophets now, if he is a person who's teaching the scriptures, then I am inclined to believe that his arguments are based out of that. You understand what I'm saying? So even when Paul is saying here, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. When I start to see the knowledge of God, this brings to my mind, God allows it to come, come to my mind, whether people agree or disagree, whether right or wrong. What comes to my mind is the prophet's arguments on the knowledge of God. Now, since they didn't want to know God or retain God in their knowledge, why? Because verse 18, the injustices of men restrained it. And uh, other scriptures let us know they had pleasure. He's going to actually say it here too. Watch he, as he closed. And they enjoyed it. You know, you have these people who enjoy doing it. It's like I was saying today, you, you, you have the ruling class who have persuaded the masses of the people to believe that capitalism will produce or give them what they desire as far as a well-being, a comfortable living, justice, equity. They have cause the people to believe that capitalism will provide that for them. And like I was saying earlier, and communism will take it from them when it's actually the opposite. So the people want justice and equity, but they think capitalism would be the best system they know to do it. And then the system that really produces it, 
communism, what they understand as communism really isn't communism. It really is a form of capitalism that takes you and rule over you by the small group of people and this and that. So you have this injustice of God. So they don't really know the truth of God. So when we start talking about capital capitalism, communism, and politics, um, the people don't know God. So therefore it's foreign. And I believe that if this is true, what we're saying, it is of high time. It is a necessity for us to learn it to even fulfill what Paul is saying in the book of Romans, because he's calling us to be saints. And according to Psalms from class a few weeks ago, I, I'm repeating it again. According to the Psalms, the saints was to declare the glory of God, to speak of his kingdom, his mighty works and all his other stuff. You understand? This is what brings real change and revolution. Now, they didn't like to know God. They, don't, they didn't want to. They enjoy unrighteousness. They've been deceived to enjoy it. Now, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. You see that? There it is. There go that word is again from verse 18. They're filled with all injustices. And injustice along with this bag is fornication, which means profanation. Even when you're looking at fornication, if you're looking at fornication just as far as uh, so-called uh, relations between uh, human beings, men and women, it's still injustice because normally it's the woman that's being exploited. And sometimes the woman exploits the men. So these are the, 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 the basics of injustices. You know, it, 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 it trickles down from government down to our how we deal with one another. But fornication just initially means um, um, profanation. But Paul also gives a, or the, the Greek is using a word as well that... Um, I want us to look at fornication and wickedness. So I wrote some of the, put some of the definitions down. Um, here, this, this fornication is Greek 4189, depravity, concretely plots, sins, iniquity, wickedness. So that's why in the Hebrew word, when they're using fornication, Sometimes we just think of fornication as sexual immorality. No, that's not all it is. Sexual immorality is profane, but that's not all it consists of. Fornication consists of iniquity, sins, profanation. Okay, so this is what he's saying is happening. Again, all injustice or unrighteousness. Here we, we have it again, injustice or unrighteousness, okay? Now, let's look at a little bit more what he's saying. Covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. And I told you to think on these things and think about how many of these things are provoked inside of a system of profits and gain, a system of exploitation. Just think of each one and, 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 and think about how these things are motivated in the socioeconomic system we live. Because again, when we read this commonly, we will probably think of, we will probably just think of, like you get 10 different people, think of 10 different things. We will probably think of the neighborhood, people we know, stuff like that. But I'm saying now Paul is dealing with something different. Why? Why? Because let's not forget that he started the letter off talking about a king to rule the world. So he started the letter off in politics. He started it off saying he is a servant of a king that is to bring in equity because that's the Hebrews Messiah. So to get down to verse 29 and think that he's no longer talking about the socioeconomic structure would be a mistake. But since we're not trained to think of the socioeconomic structure when we're reading these verses, that's not what we think of. 
We think of people. We think of somebody we know just committed adultery. We think of the camps, the churches, you know, people you know in the neighborhood. You shouldn't do it there either. But again, what is it? It starts up top and it trickles down. He's still talking about those who have the power to restrain the truth of God. Think about what he's saying. The truth of God is being detained. Who had the power to detain the truth of God? People say Satan, that's true. Now, with that angle, with that approach, Satan, where do Satan operate? In the governments, principalities and powers. Therefore, let us continue to look at these passages in that social realm. Envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boast. That's all you hear. The richer you get, the more you have these things, the more you have these qualities. You know, inventors of evil things. I mean, we see it all the time. I mean, we're talking about this now. Uh, you know, you got people lobbying for things that's detrimental to, to people. You have this big sorcery, pharmaceutical industries. This is what they do. These are what the people do, think of it, the inventors of evil things. Look around us. Who invented genetically modified foods? Who invented genetically modified seeds? Okay. Who's whispering behind the scenes to undermine and uh, destroy the people? Those who try to stand for righteousness and, and, and go against the power structure, yes, you have backbiters. You have those who will come behind them and undermine them. I mean, just so I'm just saying, think of this on a larger scale than what possibly some of us have been introduced uh, to it in our so-called religious assemblies. And it's something about the disobedient to parents that's common when we're talking about injustice. You will find this in, in, in Proverbs 30, he starts off. There's a generation that will uh, uh, not that 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 would despise their mother and their father. And guess what? This is the same generation whose teeths and, and mouths are like swords and knives, and they're trying to devour the poor from off the earth. Uh, the prophets argue the same thing. They always include this. Why? Why I believe that they're including this? It's because the disobedient to parents is a principle. And you know what, actually this principle, what, 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 what sets on this principle? The parents are what? They're the elders. So when you're looking at a village, when you're looking at a society, it's the parents that raise up the new society. So the parents really becomes the elders. The parents becomes the Senate. The parents become the rulers and the judges of the villages in the society. They are the elders. Okay, so it's not just mother, father. Think of, the, think of the role as you grow and be a parent and you grow in age, think of the role you assume. You're the leaders. You become the leaders of the society, okay? So without understanding why? Because they hid the truth of God. Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now notice this. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now think, now Mark, just jot some of this down. Envy, murder, debate, deceit, right? Just jot some of it down. Look at it. Because we want to, I wanted to put this in the context just to prove what I'm saying as we go forward, at least for you to understand uh, my approach and teaching this and studying this. Now, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, not only those who do them, but those who have pleasure, or if you look this word pleasure up in the Greek, it means to join in approving. You approve it. Or it actually says in a word studies, enthusiastically agree in them that do them. So if you look at the poorest person now, 
They've been deceived so much that they agree with the social system. In fact, they want to be a part if they could. You know, they strive, they go to school, they work, they may lie, cheat, steal, deceit, debate, murder, envy. Remember, all of these things you're naming, they, the people are full of this because they want the money bag, they want the power, they want the wealth, they want the luxury. And whatever a person do to get it, they enthusiastically agree, even if it's destroying people, even if it's destroying the earth. You understand what we're saying here? All those with this mentality, uh, the judgment of God, Paul said, will come down on them and they're all worthy of death. Now, so we're going into chapter two, but before we go into chapter two, I just want to show you now these things he named, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit. Well, is there some kind of a context that could tie this into a social, uh, a social economic environment? I would say so. Now, we remember what Paul is saying here and then take our journey into the prophet Hosea. Because remember, 2,000 years ago, if we had our Bible, if we had the scriptures, this is what we, we would be relating this to. What else would they relate it to? They're not going to relate it to Homer. They won't be going down into the, uh, into the, to the academy to, to, to dialogue and, and, and look through the writings of uh, Aristotle or Plato, right? You know, here they're going into the writing of the Hebrews. So what we have, remember some of the things he named. Now, notice carefully if some of this is going to come up again. Now, remember the argument. The truth of Yahuwah is suppressed by injustice. And so he began to name some things, uh, deceit, murder, but it started off with, I know y'all know, but I, you know, that repetition is something, but it started off with a injustice. Remember, they feel with all injustice, then he began to run down fornication, covetous, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate. He began to run all of that down. And let's see what we find here. Let's just see what we find. He started with injustice again and began to name down these, run down these things. Now we go to where I want, I want eight. Look at this, Hosea chapter four, verses one, two, and then we're gonna to skip to six and seven. This is the context I'm putting Romans in, the prophets. Now look at what he just finished saying. <clears throat> in that society, and the injustice which prevailed. Now look, the truth of God was being suppressed. Now notice, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. Remember Paul said that the writings of the prophets and the law and the prophets are our end samples, that we won't lust and make the same mistakes that they have done in times past. This is what he said in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. So with that in mind, notice the similarities. And the word of the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, excuse me, or Yehoah, ye children of Israel. For Yehoah or the Lord hath a controversy. Jot that down. To, so we, because we're going to look at two other prophets, then we're going to go into chapter two. He has a controversy. There's a controversy. You see that? There's a controversy. With who? The inhabitants of the land. Now, who y'all think Hosea they are talking to? You think, had, you think Hosea uh, talking to the local beggar? Who, who, who's this message to get to? The kings, the governments, the rulers in Israel, the princes, right? So uh, he has the controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth. You see that? Because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor what? I hope you can still hear me because they saying something going on with my internet connection. So um, I hope everything is still good here. You can hear me. But do you notice so far, there is no truth. You see that? 
There is no truth. Good, thank you. What was Paul saying in Romans? In Romans, the first chapter, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness or injustice that restrains or detains the truth of God by injustice. This is the exact same thing that's happening here in Hosea. There is no truth. Why? Because it is detained. Why? Because of injustice. Now, notice there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Remember what Paul said? They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So he gave them over to things which are not convenient or what he, uh, that word convenient means um, proper. Is this the same thing? We have the truth of God being withheld, verse one, nor there, is, there isn't any knowledge of God in the land, which signifies they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You see that. Now, Paul said, by this unrighteousness, it caused murder, theft, fornication, all that stuff. Now, let's see. Notice the parallel. Verse two, by swearing, lying, right? Isn't that deceit, right? Killing, isn't that murder? You see, this is what Paul's talking about. Stealing and committing adultery or fornication. They break out and blood touches blood. So when I'm arguing that what Paul is bringing to the table in this Romans, he's this isn't something that we just take and interpret ourselves and we look in our own little neighborhoods, somebody acting a fool, the local drug dealer, the prostitute. No, no, that, that's not, they, they shouldn't do what they're doing. Don't get me wrong. But the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because of a problem that exists in the seats of authority. And what we have is now Paul's argument in Romans. The argument is what injustice produces. So this is a socioeconomic argument or context I'm bringing and trying to introduce. So same thing he said, right? Fornicating, wickedness, murder, deceit, right? Disobedient to parents. Okay, and uh, fornication. Same thing that we read in Hosea. By swearing, lying, killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Why is that? Because the social economic society or the social environment restrain the injustice, the institutionalized injustice has held back or re restrained the truth so there is no truth nor knowledge of God in the land. Verse six, here it is again. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because Paul said, if you do these things because you don't want to retain God in your knowledge, you know that you're going to be destroyed. He said, because, you know, death is pending if all those who do those things and those who are enthusiastic about it, those who enthusiastically agree, they shall also be liquidated. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast what? Rejected knowledge. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. So if we read what Paul is saying, this is the same argument, the same struggle in Hosea. Is to bring in a socio-political uh, uh, kingdom that will bring in justice. This is Paul's argument in Romans, to bring in a socio-economic kingdom will bring, which will bring in injustice. That's why he started with, I am a servant of the Hebrew Mashiach. And I am calling you to be saints that I may bear fruit among you. Fruit to do what? And that's where the sauce get 
all over the place when we're not understanding the context and the environment in which Paul is, is drawing this from, the prophets. And it's a chain link. This chain go all the way back to Abraham's, whose children is to bring in a social, political society of egalitarianism. I mean, that's just a continual link throughout the book. And it's been real clever for the enemies to make people think otherwise. So the truth of God is being suppressed by injustice. This is exactly what we're reading here in Hosea. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, Paul going to bring this in in Romans, the second chapter, the law of God. Who shall be justified? The doers of it. You know, so he's, he's not going away from what the prophets wrote. He made it clear. He said, listen, follow me as I follow Christ. I mean, because there are many ways to get back to, to, to prove this argument. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, who do they think Christ was? Christ said, who do men say that I am? I mean, we could take many different angles. What, 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 is, what does students say? They say you John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah, or one of the prophets of old. Now, if he deviated and went outside of the law and the prophets, why in the world would the people think he was one of the prophets of old? Short answer, they wouldn't think it because he didn't deviate from it. He didn't write no new books to show anything different. The book he had was the law and the prophets. That's the book he used. So when he's saying to prove who he is, when he says search the scriptures, what book was he talking about? He ain't writing no new book. He ain't have to. It was at the... the, the the books of the prophets and law and prophets are just fine. And they are preserved from generation to generation. This is what the Psalms say. So if Paul followed Christ, and he said, follow me as I follow Christ, or Mashiach, the Hebrew Mashiach, then we know from reading the Gospels that the Hebrew Mashiach was thought of, thought to be one of the prophets of old. So guess where that leads us back to? The prophets and the confirming and the authenticity of their teaching as sound and true and no one broke from them. Think not. So with that being said, we must understand the context of these prophets and understand that they were freedom fighters those who were struggling for liberation, not a bunch of men who were trying to set up a religion or restore a religion called Judaism. That is simply not what they were trying to do. Never, never made an effort. Their effort was to fulfill the word of God that I know Abraham and he will teach his children the ways of the Lord, that they will do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon, in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. One chain link never is never broken, all the way down to New Jerusalem. But because the truth of God is being suppressed by injustice, we got to... We, 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 gotta, we must be liberated. Truth set us free. And it's going to set the world free once we act on truth. Now it says, look, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children as they were increased. You see that? So whether they increase in the population as they increase in the population, they're increasing in what? Wealth. Ezekiel described it. They increase in wealth, corn, grain, oil. And they, and, they, and, they, and they got rich and they chased after their lovers because of the market. The prophets describe all of this. So as they increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, will I change their glory into shame? 
tribulation and anguish to the Jew first who walks contrary. There's something about the increasing of wealth without the knowledge of God always leads to a disaster. Now look what he's saying. We got the truth of God being suppressed by injustice. So the point being is I want to show you the context of the, of, of social, of the social political world that Paul is making reference to here uh, if we compare what he's saying here in Hosea and in the prophets to what he's saying in Romans. He's not deviating from that. He's not just talking about any wickedness. He's building a case for the Messiah. Now we go to Micah. Now remember, he has the controversy. So let's go to another prophet, Micah. The controversy. There is no truth or knowledge of God in the land. The controversy is that the truth of Yah is being suppressed by injustice. That's the controversy. Micah 6, 2, and then we're going to skip to 9 through 12. Continuing. The controversy of Yehoah. Truth being holding back by injustice. Watch. Going to a different prophet. Same argument. Hear, O mountains. Hear ye, O mountains. The Lord's controversy. Listen up, you societies and governments of the world. Listen, and ye strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. Let's skip down to verse 9. <clears throat> the Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod. And who hath appointed it. In other words, the man of wisdom shall understand. They shall understand. The people of wisdom. But those. But there's many in whom the truth of God has being, is being held back. Now watch this. This controversy. Of injustice. That was just described by Hosea. Following up with Micah. The same controversy. Hosea said he had a controversy. No knowledge of God in the land. Now, how did this happen? How did the not by injustice and deceit and lies? Just what he was run, running down in Romans, the first chapter. Let's see if we find it again. Are there yet treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is abominable? Whoa. The controversy is going into political economy just as it was in the days of the Romans. Caesar, gospel, supported the treasures of wickedness. Caesar, gospel, supported the scant measure or the robbery of the citizens in the market and in labor, just like it is today. This is the controversy. Shall I count, verse 11, shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and the and, and with and with the bag of deceitful weights? A lot of people don't like that. I mean, just bringing, bring, bringing this out for years, I mean, people have a problem with that. They do not like that. But what can I say? Like I said, I'm not arguing nothing. My, I'm just simply, only thing I gotta do is present what I'm reading. Now, whether it's wrong, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Show me or somebody. But I mean, I know people don't like it, but they don't show it. I mean, people who, have uh, associated themselves uh, with the uh, Knesset and the NMP. Yeah, you know, I mean, to this day, I mean, some of them, I don't, the business practices and, and, and rent and, 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 and usury, I mean, I, you know, they have a problem with saying that, you know, uh, the way business practices held, if you got products and you wanna mark up the price of the product, Listen, I didn't make this stuff up. You know, this is just the society. I'm simply saying we got to do it the right way. Okay, no use to get mad. Okay, we got to do it the right way. But some people get frustrated because some people got to start over. And that's what renewing your mind is about. That's not an easy task to even begin. To realize, dang, on it, all of this time and, and time spent, I got to re I got to rethink all of this. Yeah, that's a task. But that's what you got to do. 
So these wicked balances and bags of deceit, we got them all the time. Retail store prices, the clothes being sold in the markets, you know, every people on the corner selling incense and oils. All everywhere you look in the market of Babylon, it is balances of deceitful weights. And it's so frustrating for people because they don't know nothing else other than how to make a living, other than robbing people. But they don't know it's robbery because it's legal. It's legalized. Verse 12, for the rich men thereof are full of violence. Violence is 2555. He said the rich men thereof are full of violence. You see that, that violence? I just want to show you, um, read that to you, violence. Or go to that definition, excuse me. Violence, I should have it down here. Um, what slide is this? this is slide six. Uh, I think I want, maybe I want my other definitions. Um, bear with me a second. I thought I could find it right offhand. Um, here it is down here at the bottom. Strong exhaustive concordance. Shamas or Kamas, Hebrew 2555. He said the rich men are full of violence. And what he's saying, they're full of cruelty. This, isn't this what Paul was describing in, in Romans? damaging, false, injustice, oppressor, unrighteous, which is injustice, okay? It is violence by implication wrong, the, by metonymy, unjust gain, cruel. This is it, deceit. All of this is what Paul was describing. And it takes on a different nature when you're looking at it from a socio-political perspective and not just people we know, we may know personally who we think that just doing some evil. No, man, this, this, this Paul is addressing this on a socio political level. And this is exact, why? Be, why? Because this is exactly how the prophets are doing it. So they're full of unjust gain, violence, oppression, and deceit. And because of this, the rich men are full of violence or unjust gain and, 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 and deceit and, and, and robbery and injustice. The inhabitants thereof, for the rich men thereof are full of violence and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Same thing Paul said, full of whisper, deceit, wickedness, fornication. Just what Micah and Hosea, I bring it to the table. This is exact. I'm saying this is what Paul is arguing. There's a context to his argument. Now watch this. Seeing this is the context to his argument, notice something. Because we've been commonly taught, like I say, only God knows what we're able to do. But I tell you, it may be a mistake for us to believe and, and say what we can't do. So that's that idea of moving the mountains. Hear ye, O mountains, and you foundations of the earth. They could be moved if we have the faith. But if we don't have the faith, what did the book, what did the Bible say? It is impossible to please Elohim. That's serious business because you like, listen, he have created this peculiar creature called man. And they can do some wonders because God, only because God works through them. But what happens when you don't want to do it? What happens when you want to be like Jonah? Jonah, go do my job. What if you don't want to do, you, you like Jonah. Jonah couldn't get out of it. I mean, God knows, please don't let me have to get swallowed up and, and go through a bunch of torment to do what he say do. So it's important to know the context of these things because he's calling us to be saints. Remember Romans, the first chapter. Notice what these men are saying. Now, we see the injustice. We see the truth of God being withheld by injustice, right? We see that, okay? Look, 
What of it? Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 4. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Let's see if we're going to find it just a, three, out of my two or more witnesses. That's why I'm doing three, just to confirm the argument. This idea that Paul is bringing to the table, that the truth of God is being suppressed, this is, this is you, you find this all in the prophets. So it says the truth, it says, the lower hand is ensured that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, right? But what? Your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. There it is again. Why? For your hands are defiled with blood. Wait, we're speaking about injustice then. Your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies. Same argument Paul was bringing in Romans. Same things he was naming through all the lists of the injustices and wickedness. We see the same prevailing thing, lies, deceit, profanity, fornication, right? Your tongue hath muttered perverseness, deceitful tongue. And none calleth for justice, nor any pleaded for truth. There it is. They got that truth of God in. So here's that truth of God being restrained. None plead for truth because they have all given themselves to injustice. So this injustice has restrained or detained the truth of God. Now guess who posts the liberated? People, the saints. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity, or as Paul said, wickedness. All injustices, all unrighteousness and wickedness. Isaiah 59, skipping down to verse 8, the way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is the judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. So if justice isn't overtaking you, guess what's overtaking you? Unrighteousness or injustice. So we have this truth of God, because none calling for truth, is being detained by injustice. See that? That's what Paul, that's, that, that's, so therefore, seeing this is what the prophets are arguing, I place this context in Romans. This is, this is what, this is Paul's argument, because he's following the same pattern as Yehoshua Yeho HaMashiach, and Yehoshua HaMashiach followed the same pattern and fought the same cause of the prophets of old. So this is my methodology through the grace of God. This because you can grab it from anywhere. You could you could say anything is unrighteous. You could say, you know, God spoke to you, yelled at you, he unrighteous. You could say anything is unrighteous or wicked. But I think for us to really grasp the message of the gospel, no, there's specifics here. There's there's chain links, parallels. And I say this is a parallel. Neither doth justice overtake us, signifying injustice prevails. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. In transgressing and lying against the Lord. See that? Lying against him. Haters of God, Paul talked about. Haters of God. Holding the truth. If you're lying against the Lord, you're retaining the truth. And what else he say? Departing away from our God. These are haters of God. Speaking oppression and revolt. Conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. This is what he's describing without natural affection. Deceit. I mean, if you look at some of the things that the Apostle Paul was arguing here, it is, it's, it's, it's maliciousness, which is wickedness, envy, murder, debate, unmerciful, inventors of evil things, right? Now, 
we have here haters of God, despiteful, proud. All of these, I'm saying, place in this greater context. Uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Verse 14. And judgment is turned away backwards and justice standeth afar off. And what? Truth is fallen in the streets. It's restrained. And equity cannot enter. So, if the truth of God that Paul speaks of in Romans 1 and 18 is being suppressed or restrained or detained by injustice, we see this is exactly what the prophets are describing. Now, what we're learning additionally from the prophets is that indirectly, I will say, if truth is picked up and men call for truth, like he said in Hosea, guess what will enter? Equity will enter. Justice will overtake us. You see? So here we have right before us Caesar, the context of Caesar, and Mashiach in Romans. We have Yehoshua who want to bring in justice, equity, and the truth of God. And we have the environment of Rome, carbon copy of the fallen state of Israel, who suppress this truth where equity can't enter and justice does not overtake the people. This is not hocus pocus. If we want to see and experience justice and equity, we must pick up the truth and call for truth. If we are saints like Paul is calling us to be, he's not calling us to go set up a, a local corner church and do revivals unless your revivals is uh, 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 stirring up the people to bring forth truth just as inequity, other than that. I, I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about truth, justice, and equity. This is what the Messiah good news is about. These are parallels. Now, seeing this is the case, let's go now. This is what he's saying. Now, we see this is how he was closing that first chapter of Romans. We looked at the prophets to find out um, what social, what context do we put that in? I'm saying in a social, in a social economic political context, because that's the context of the prophets. Now, with that being said, still in the context of Paul arguing and addressing the principalities and powers, because that's who he said the church is sent to make the mystery of God known to. Now he's going to reflect on those who are supposed to bring this argument. And here in Romans, the second chapter, starting at verse one. Romans, second chapter, starting at verse one. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. What? Who's inexcusable? The one who, knowing the truth of, start from Romans 1 and 32, he said, who, knowing the judgment of God, and they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure, or they are enthusiastically approve. They enthusiastically approve of it. That's what he mean by have pleasure in them that do them. You are just sold to the injustice and the uh, all of what the society produces. That's why they called it. You had some in that environment calling Octavian or uh, Caesar his reign good news. They were enthusiastic about what that environment produced. 
But what it produced was none other than the wrath of God. It produced injustice. And Paul saying the wrath of God is going to come down on you and bring death to all those who do it and love for it to be done. Now, how are we delivered from the wrath? Because again, he's writing it to the comrades. He want to bear fruit. So you got to tell him something now. And this is what we all got to know. That's why it's parts in, 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 in what we teach. People ask about, when well, we going to do this? Are you going to teach this? We, we, you got to be patient. We're going to get around to it. We're going to get around to it. You got to be patient. I know people are used to the microwave. You understand? Quick stuff. Uh-uh. No, no. That's not how we do it. We slow cook around here from scratch. So it, it, you, you need to know. You need to know your product. You need to know what you're dealing with. So what we have here, therefore thou art inexcusable. Who's inexcusable? Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. What do you mean? For wherein thou judgest another, you are inexcusable because when you judge another, thou condemnest thyself. Why? For thou that judgest doest the same things. In other words, we see this injustice. If he's going to call us to be, if he's writing his letter to organize saints, that means we got to get cleaned up. People say, what do we do? For we got to get educated, we got to get cleaned up. That's how the wrath of God will not come on us. Now, look what he's explaining. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. See, this word truth he's using is means also, it's so deep in the Greek, they say, in a word study, it means not only is it true, but it is the real reality of the of the cosmos. It's the it's 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 because you have virtual realities, you have realities that others have created. No, when he's saying the truth of God, he's talking about the real reality of creation. And we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. In other words, that these the truth in the reality of what we live in, this entire cosmos, it will not tolerate this injustice. It will not. And the magnificence of the earth and creation sort of, it convinces me of that more and more. Why all of this stuff is a lie. This, this, this what we're living is it, what we live in, not just our bodies, but this planet, this cosmos, is it's just beyond words. It's a miracle. If if it's just extraordinary. It's been downplayed, but this is something that's you could just marvel. And and what is that to say? of the power that made it, that created it, that put it in motion. Now, understanding that, it's the same power that put this in motion. It's the same power that, in which all of this sits upon. The foundation of all of this is justice. That is a science for us to consider the importance. See. In this world, we might not even make the connection. Especially with justice and God. You go, well, how does that work? Truth of God been held back. People don't see. Look, you, you this is this is this is phenomenal. Once we put these two together, the creator and justice and equity, and strive for that, you're unstoppable. Look what he says here. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Verse three. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So he's letting us know the judgment of God coming. And for those, remember, this is a letter to those who he want to be saints. This is the letter to them that he may have fruit among them. Remember, this is what he was in saying in Romans. I'm not going to click to it because I have it in another set of slides. But remember in Romans, the first chapter, that he said he's ready to preach the gospel to the Romans. 
right? And he was arguing that before he was going to preach the gospel to them, he said that He wanted to come unto them in verse 13, Romans 1 and 13. He said, now I would not have you ignorant, brother, that oft times I proposed to come unto you, but was let hither dear, hitherto, that I might ha have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He want to have fruit. He want to bring them down to sainthood. That's why he said in verse 15, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the good news to you that are at Rome. Right? To have fruit, to become saints. So in order to become saints, he said, listen, what I'm presenting to you, and you may recognize all this evil, but guess what? Thinkest thou this that judges the others that if you do the same things, you're going to escape? Now, you know, people say, well, you can't judge. You know, I hear that too. People say, well, you can't judge. You know, don't judge. You can't judge. Is that true? I, somebody just said that. I hear it so often. Somebody actually just said it to me a couple of days ago. They were being scorned. They trying to tell somebody about the word. And other people, well, how are you going to judge them? You can't judge. And they quote the script, well, judge not. And they probably even read this. Listen, therefore thou art an excusable old man, whosoever thou art that judges. And they stop there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Watch this. Let, I want to clear this part up. I want God will, I want to at least dress, address it, whether I'm right or wrong. Uh, I think that they're not telling us the true story about this judge business. You can't, I'm, I'm sure you probably heard, you can't judge me. Yeah, is that right? But let's see what he's actually saying. He's actually saying, you can't judge if you're doing the same thing. That's what he's saying, you're inexcusable. If they finish reading it, this is his argument. No. Who are you, old man, that ju old man, old man that judges and you doing the same thing? Verse one, right? Then he said it again. Verse two, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And then he says in verse three, O man that judges them which do such things and doeth the same, you think you're going to escape? Now know what he, what he says in verse four. What is he actually arguing? Or despises thou the riches, uh, rich, riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? What's his argument? Stop doing it. The goodness of God leads you to repentance to no longer do those things. I'm calling you to be saints. What do you think binding kings and nobles and fetters and irons is about? Don't you think that's a judgment? Paul said we don't even judge angels. We won't, people don't been put to shame. You can't judge me. They get put, well, I ain't judging you. Well, you're wrong then. If you're doing the right thing and not committing the same things, then you have full right. Because Paul is getting this argument from the Messiah. Look at this, verse five. Because the saints must address the issues and judge and speak against the injustice in the world. So in order for them to do that, he's saying you can't do that if you act in a fool. That's like here in, in, growing. I mean, through all the years we've seen, I've, 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 I, 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 through experience, I've learned that's just the truth. You can't get nothing done when you have foolishness. It got to a point where you look at all these different camps and groups and we, we wasn't excluded. That's why we were building this thing. We, we got to do this the right way. You, you know, you look around, it's all contention, strife, backbiting. You would never, ever be victorious. 
in that state of condition. But after, so he's telling us to repent. Stop doing the evil. Once you stop doing the evil, then you can judge. Watch this. But after thy after thy hardness, but after thy hardness and imp, impenit, impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the just judgment of God. What are you coming to judge? You see, this is where the Greeks run into a conflict. Is this love, the wrath of God? But our discussion I don't love today, but I just hear so much as irritate the, me. People running around, you know, they they get they 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 get they uh, 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 sentiment from people want to sit up here and talk about love, and they a bunch of uh, despisers. They, they they despise God. They abuses of themselves with mankind. A bunch of homosexuals running around, a bunch of pedophiles, baby killers, and they want to sit around and talk about the love of God. They even had the nerve to even make the attempt to, to even speak ill of the mighty one of Abraham and speak against his word. And he's a bunch of baby killers and pedophiles and homosexuals. And, and they just so arrogant and proud. And they want to sit up and talk about the love of God. See, but God have turned them over to do those things because they don't want to retain him. And they now they only want to learn of them. So they think they got it all figured out. And, and we can't listen to them or else we're going to be messed up when we think in the love. This is the same wrath of God. The same wrath of God that was going to come upon the people on Isaiah's day, Hosea's day, and Micah's day because there was no truth, no knowledge of God in the land. And nothing changed. He changed not. Look what he says here. Let's look at this judgment thing. In other words, we got to get ourselves in order. If we don't get ourselves in order, just shut up. Ain't no use even, don't do nothing. You, you, if, you don't, if we don't get ourselves in order, then this mission of the gospel, we can't do it. We won't be qualified. If we can't get it in order and follow things according to the book and mercy, love, and compassion, we can't get it in order. And one way to do it is like Proverbs say, you got to identify, like Paul said, uh, observe those who walk among you, those who gender strife, contention, and separate. Because there's so much at stake. I mean, we if you don't mind losing being heir to the world, then not, hey, you might not mind it. But those who this is important to, a lot is at stake. You don't want nothing to interrupt it. So you have to judge. You have to judge. You have to see who's among you. They got a sincere heart or not? Are they there just to be there? They there, they ain't, they ain't really serious about what they're doing. You got to find out. Then you got to find those who, who are sincere. And then you, you, God willing, you work and you pray, you work with them. But each man have to go and look first. Where do you stand? So just before you come out and accuse a brother or a sister, what you do? Now look what the Messiah said. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now these, what Paul is building because he, he's getting saints. So he's, he's, he's gathering saints. So as we work through the book of Romans, we're going to be getting some lessons politically and in-house. In-house. On how the revolutionaries must deal with each other to even take on the task to be soldiers for Christ. Heck, if we don't do if we don't do what we need to do in house, like he said, just y'all need to love one another like I love y'all. If you don't have that, then you can't even carry on the task. You you won't even you not you won't even have a chance ever. So he said, look, judge not that ye be not judged. That's where people stop. Is that true? Don't judge. Judge not that ye be not judged. All right, for those of us who are going to read the Bible, let's just read a few more verses. Let's see if it's going to be the same thing that Paul was explaining. He said, for with that judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. That's what Paul was saying. You doing the same things? And with that measure ye meet, it shall be met to you again. That's what Paul was explaining in Romans. 
And why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye and considereth not the beam that is in thy own eye? You see where we're going? Paul said, how can you judge when you're doing the same thing? Messiah is taking another step. How can you judge when you're doing worse? Or how will thou say, verse four, or how will I say to thy brother, let me pull out that mote out of thine eye and behold, a beam is in thy is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite. That's what Paul was explaining in Romans, the first chapter. This is the this is the in-house teaching of all of the soldiers. Soldiers, you sit down, men and women, soldiers sit down and get this. Understand it. Because we can we could be theoreticians, but if that's going to be limited because he's going to limit our understanding if we don't do what we need to do. Because when we do what we're supposed to do, then more is revealed. He said, but you hypocrites, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. Paul said, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. This is what the Messiah is saying. God give you time, cast out the beam out thy own eye. And then, you see what Paul was saying? Same thing his, his teacher was saying. And then shalt thou see clearly to judge or to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. He's not saying you don't judge at all. He's just saying you got to get yourself together or else you'll be a hypocrite. Take the beam out your eye. Once you get yourself in order, Right? If we're if we're to be saints, we see the world is out of order. That's what Paul showed us in Romans. The world is out of order. Now, how are we gonna get this in order? How are we gonna get it out of order? We we in shambles. So you see, this is you can judge. People just need to just read a few more verses and find out. They ain't talking about you just judge, be not just no, no. You can judge. Just be it's just it's a warning. If you do judge. The same as you meet going to be met back to you. So make sure that you're not a hypocrite and you got it in order. Get yourself cleaned up and then you can help your brother. Peter uh, argues this, 2 Peter 3rd chapter, verses 13 and 14. Notice this. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth justice. That's what we're looking for. Are we looking for a world of justice? Now watch Peter follow the same sentiment as his teacher and his companion. Saul, his companion, and his teacher, Yehoshua ben Dawi. Watch. We're looking for justice. That's what Paul is arguing in Romans. And then look what Peter goes back to. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without what spot and blameless. In other words, make sure that that make sure that you can, you know, you ain't got that beam in your eye. Make sure you don't have that moat in your eye. Make sure, like Paul said, you're not doing the same things. You see, this is the prerequisite of justice. This is the prerequisite of establishing the new heaven and a new earth. We ain't got it together, ain't nothing happening. We, actually, we all wasting our time. Sound good, don't it? But if we're going to do something, we got to get this in order. We're going to need it. When, so when we're saying the team and the team, and I'm telling you from experience, over 20 some years from experience, nothing good comes from the division. Nothing good comes from people not on the same page. Your friendship don't last long enough that you think you got a friendship because y'all can watch the game together. You can go bowling together. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That isn't sustainable. The word is sustainable. And you ask how I know? Because I have observed it. And I can say to this day, the people who don't associate with, uh, for lack of, for, with, the, with this organization is because they don't believe what we're saying. And that's okay. If you don't believe, you don't believe it. We could be wrong. My point is, we don't, we don't believe. They don't believe the same thing. And I've been told that, point blank. I, I just, I don't believe it.
Okay. I think that's at least we're honest. We're looking for a new heaven and new earth. We got to be on the same page. We have to clean ourselves up. And how? when I mean clean ourselves up, I mean we got to submit to the will of God. And now Paul is walking us into, because I'm not going to go much further with this tonight. I'm going to open it up. But I wanted to set that stage first. I felt it was important to look at Paul's argument in Romans so far is socio-political. Now, when we say socio-political, we include everybody. You understand what I'm saying? When I'm saying socio-political, this, this doesn't exit out the commoner. This brings it all together. The opposite has been done. When you don't look at it as socially politically, you're just looking at your primary focus are, are those who have no power, the victims. And I say, when you look at Christ's ministry or Yehoshua's ministry, how often do you see him scorning the victims, the poor? You, don't, you think all of the poor people who he was with, that they just all walked in Torah? Probably not. But you don't see him scorning them, the prostitute, the tax collector. They argue with him. Why is your teacher sitting with sinners? <laughs> huh? And then our teacher sitting, breaking bread with sinners, they're going to get up and rail on who? The leaders. And he's telling the sinners, search the scriptures. But you see, his rebuke wasn't just on the, he told the prostitutes sin no more. What did he tell the leaders? You hypocrites, y'all stupid, dumb devils. You a bunch of snakes. And I'm here to tell you, he ain't whisper it. And he had no microphones. I mean, he had to tell, he had, I think he had a little pitch. He getting up to let them know what they is. You snakes. You don't know God. Y'all dumb foolish and that's some but he began to tell his students you got to love each other you have to this is the strategy for revolution the body of the revolutionaries must be on point in order for the spirit of god and the power of god to dwell among them Okay, so this is the where he's going. And we're going to start to look at some parallels, some more parallels as we proceed through chapter two. He's looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Peter said, we got to be without spot, without blemish. Christ arguing before you can judge others, you got to get yourself cleaned up. That's what Paul began to argue in Romans, the first our second chapter verses one through five he started to deal with uh he started to argue the position to judge and self-evaluation you can't have a revolution without that you can't have a revolution without self-evaluation and we must evaluate ourselves according to the word of god and that word of god we got one thing the word of god is going to immediately do is going to strip us of individualism that's hard to do for people the military do it though don't they you go into the military they strip you of individualism you you walk out there looking the same cut your hair give you the same clothes they strip you of individualism entering into the body or the uh uh, uh kingdom of god we stripped of individualism. We have to start to think as the group, as a whole. And that's why it's important, these teachings to move forward, okay? So we're gonna get ready to open up to ask a few questions here. Um, I didn't get far into, but I want to, as we work going into chapter two, I definitely want us to look at the, um, the socio-political climate, all right? And so we'll be picking it up here, Romans 2 and 6, and see what's happening. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? That's what he's arguing. Don't you know, old man, that if you do the same thing, you're going to suffer. 
and he's going to bring in a what? Verse seven, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Eternal life in what? Immortality in what context? You're going to take eternal life and just set it by itself. What you hooking it to? Eternal life doing what? Immortality, immortal, where you, 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 where? What context are you placing me? In the cloud, what, where? Glory and honor, what exactly is the glory? What is it exactly? And before you can get the glory, honor, immortality, eternal life, he says something here called well-doing. Now, what's that? You understand? So you ask, what, what is well-doing? If we traditionally taught, just like we're traditionally taught, what we looked at earlier about all of the different uh, deceit and backbiting and wickedness, traditionally taught, we don't place that in the context of what the prophets are placing it in. What is well-doing that leads to glory and honor? They're specific about this. This well-doing is obeying the truth. What exactly is it? Is it not eating pork and keeping the Sabbath day? What is well doing? Opening the door for people, you understand? Dropping off groceries in the soup kitchens. I'm not saying none of that stuff is bad. I'm saying, is that exactly what he's making reference to? First and foremost. Verse 10. Glory and honor again and peace to every man that worketh good. So well-doing and worketh good bring forth glory, honor, and peace, eternal life, immortality. But he said to the contentious who do not obey the truth or who restrains the truth and obey what? Injustice, indignation, and wrath. So we got to investigate that. So after he finished saying, get yourself together, he's going to be going back and forth about, he, he, he's going to expound on this because he's, he's sending a letter to the church to, to equip them for this mission. So he got to address their conduct and he's going to address what's happening in the world around them and tell them not to pick up these ways. Okay. And we got to look into more what he's talking about here. Um, According to the law and the prophets, what is this context of well-doing and working good? What is this about? What do you mean obey injustice, indignation, and wrath? Just like we compared it tonight with holding the truth or suppressing the truth and seeing it's identical to what the prophets argue. We're gonna find this there. We're gonna find this in there too. Where well, we're gonna place this right where in a particular context and not our own, where we come up with what well doing is. All right. So with that, let's open it up. I spent some time on it. We have